Hey folks, how's it going? So today we are taking a look at the 1TD kit from CSS Audio that I built. Uh, the video where I built this speaker will be in the description of this video. Make sure to check it out after this video. But right now it's perfectly finished. I'm a very happy person. It's finished in nice walnut veneer. I have a nostalgia about veneer and walnut. And so I sent this to Joe and his team to finish it. And they did a fantastic job of veneering this speaker. So I'll link to his business and website in the description below. I think he is the man to go to when it comes to a speaker project. If you want to do anything related to DIY and stuff like that, he is the man to go to. So go and check him out as well. Now, before I go into the full on review of this beautiful speaker and the difference between the superior crossover and the standard crossover and all that, all that good stuff, I want to introduce you to Surfshark. So Surfshark is the provider of VPN software. And what that does is basically it helps you be safe when you're browsing on the internet, it protects you. And also aside from that, you can use VPN to log into different regions. So if you're region locked, meaning that you're in Canada and you want to watch something from Japan, then sometimes sometimes you can't, you know, when you're watching Netflix, I've been watching a lot of Netflix. Sometimes you can't, but with VPN, you can do that. Same thing with US, you wanna play a game from the US or watch content from the US that you just don't have access to, you're region locked, then VPN lets you do that. So a great example of this is that, you know, me and my girlfriend was playing Modern Warfare Warzone together in the same space and it just wouldn't let us do that because, you know, they, they were like, oh, you can't play, you know, in the same network. So what I did was I logged into a different region using Surfshark and we were able to play. So the game was seeing that I was in the US and my girlfriend was in my room playing the same game. Now they are, like I said, sponsoring this video, which means that you get 85% off for a two year plan. Plus you get three extra months when you sign up with the link in the description below. So make sure to check them out. And I promise you it becomes really, really handy. And I've been always using VPN and you know, Surfshark VPN is one of the best ones that I've came across. Okay, so guys, looking at this speaker, um, I'm not going to go into the details of the specifications and all that stuff. Um, it is 87 dBs in efficiency at eight ohms, that's about it. Uh, all the measurements and stuff, they have it available on their website. I'll link it in the description below. Make sure to check it out if you are interested in the measurements and stuff like that, but we're not gonna get too much into it. Now, what we are going to talk about today is my listening experience with this speaker. So as you know, I've reviewed the Bocardas 400, the S300, and many of these speakers in the, you know, two to $5,000 category. And I listened to a lot of speakers much higher in price point. Now, where does this speaker stand? You no, know, did I actually enjoy myself listening to the speaker? And my answer immediately is hell yes. And I'll explain to you why. So this speaker is a DIY kit and it brings tremendous value. Now, not all DIY kits bring tremendous value. Let's get that clear. Um, I've had DIY kits where I thought it was complete shit and I won't name all of them, but a lot of them were just not that good, at least when I started out. So here, I'm very impressed with this kit because it just works phenomenally. And like I said, if you check the video where I built it, it's just seamless to build. So how does it sound? You know, how does it sound, Jay? Well, the first thing that I noticed with the speaker is that the bass actually goes down much lower, in my opinion, than the CSS Audio P215 that I reviewed. And plus, it goes quite low, as, as low as the Bacard S400. And with certain gear like the first Watt F7 amplifier, I was very impressed by the fact that this speaker just whoop, goes down really, really low. And to an extent where, you know, I reviewed the Gershman um, avant-garde speakers, it didn't go down that uh, as low as that speaker. I mean, granted that speaker is like $14,000, but this speaker did go down quite a bit and it did give that, you know, uh, physical feeling of bass. And for a bookshelf speaker, that is very impressive. I mean, I was impressed with the S400 feeling like a floor standing speaker. Now this speaker takes it to another level in terms of how low it can go down. Now in terms of mid bass punch and kick, it is tremendous, but it is not as um, punchy or impactful as the S400. Now S400 granted does have a little bit of emphasis in that region to mimic the floor standing experience. Now this speaker actually does go down quite low and I with certain gear, 
uh, keep in mind. Now, if the gear is not able to do that, then it probably won't. But at least with the first Watt F7, I experienced tremendous bass uh, in the low frequency region. Now, coming into the mid range, um, the mid range is where we listen to most of our stuff. The vocal ranges, you know, the singer, you know, the guitar, the instruments, most of the stuff is in the mid range of things, right? So it's very important. And the mid range tonality is very, very much like to my, to my liking. Now, one thing that I will say is, uh, if a lot of you guys have been following my videos, I fell in love with the mid range and the overall tonal characteristics of a speaker from Sonos Faber, the Amator 3. I like Tama Tour 3. Now that speaker is, at least in Canada, about $14,000 with stands. And that speaker is beautifully built, obviously, and you know, it's, it's a much higher end speaker and stuff like that. But when it comes to the mid range and the bass region, the texturization and the overall tonal balance of things, this speaker was very much on par. I mean, I came very close to thinking myself, you know, well, I came to thinking myself, I don't need it. You know, I, at the end of the day, unless I'm flowing with money and I, you know, I really, really can, uh, uh, you know, in a position to buy the speaker, I really wouldn't need to buy it because this speaker does that kind of same thing. You know, it may not look as pretty or well-finished Italian craftsmanship and stuff like that. But when it comes to down to it, the mid-range and the tonal characteristic is very, very similar. And that's compared to a $14,000 bookshelf speaker, which is insane in my opinion. Now, getting into the high frequency, same story. I was very impressed immediately because in this price category, I, like I said, it's very hard to see refinement in the high frequencies. Refinement in the high frequency is something that you don't really come across in this price range, especially, you know, maybe because this is a DIY kit, it brings tremendous value, obviously. But even then, you know, high frequency refinement is something that is hard to see and you see it here. It is more refined than the Bocard S400 in the high frequency, in my opinion, and extends much higher into the high frequencies, in my opinion. Um, it's airy, in my opinion, and, you know, it is comparable to something like the Electa Amator. In fact, in the high frequency, I, I think, you know, it goes really close into refinement, and I'm very close to saying that it is a little bit slightly more refined than even the Electa Amators in some tracks. So the high frequency is exceptional. And I think that is, you know, the definition of high-end audio when it comes down to it because the tonal characteristics, the extension into the high frequency, the refinement in the high frequency, the ability to be not sharp, but smooth and have the tonal characteristics, the texture, and all that really comes down to, you know, the high-end sound and what we're looking for in a speaker. So in every aspect, this speaker checks off many lists when it comes to a speaker that I'm looking for and really, you know, there's nothing lacking. Bass, there. You know, extension down in the bass, there. I mean, the tonal characteristics in the mid-range, there. The high frequency, there. Um, so that's pretty much I have to, what I have to say about the sound quality of things when it comes to, you know, comparison with the S400. And I began with that because I know that's what you guys wanna hear. That's what you guys want to know about. But here's the catch though. Whatever I'm talking about right now, right, the refinement in the high frequency, in the mid-range and stuff like that, I'm talking about the standard crossover. So that's the one without the $400 superior crossover. So what happens when you add the superior crossover? Now I did an A-B test where um, I took out the superior crossover, put in the uh, you know, standard crossover and back and forth with the same tracks and I've been you know, doing A-B testing. And what it comes down to it really, um, the superior crossover actually makes a pretty huge difference. And the difference is not subtle. It is quite obvious, at least to me, uh, when I go back and forth. The superior crossover, you know, really brings out the bass region, uh, the texture in the bass, and also the sound stage seems to be improved. And the first thing that you will notice, however, is the background becomes a lot more quiet. There's less grain to it. And you know, when, what do you mean by grain? You know, a lot of people ask me, what the hell do you mean by grain? And people with headphones, they've probably experienced this. You know, you go from a lower uh, tier headphone to a higher end headphone, you immediately, re you know, recognize higher resolution, less grain, uh, less background noise and all that stuff. And that's what you get, You the sense of resolution change. It's like going from a 720p to a 1080p and then you are like, oh my God, it's so much better. But then you put it on the large screen and you're like, okay, the 1080p has some grain to it. You go to 4K and boom, 
grain gone, image is much sharper. And that is what I mean, the grain is lifted. It's like a veal has been lifted. And you get that with the superior crossover. And it's not a subtle difference. And you know, especially with well-recorded tracks, which reveals a lot of the grain, um, you know, you immediately notice it. And like I said, the imaging, the sharpness of the image improves, improves, so the imaging is improved as well. And also, like I said, the separation between instruments, you know, soundstage, everything a little bit improves. And that all adds up to being an obvious improvement. So that is what the Superior Crossover brings to the table. And if you ask me, is it, you know, I've, been, I've been getting a lot of questions. You no, know, is it worth it for me to get the Superior Crossover, Jay? And my opinion is yes. Yes, it is. Um, at least with this speaker, and I've seen speakers where crossover improvement in components and stuff like that hasn't uh, improved the speaker in a lot of ways. But you know, I at least with this speaker, I have to say it improves it quite significantly. And I do definitely recommend getting the superior crossover if you want the superior performance out of these speakers. And even then, the price is very reasonable and it does compete and crush a lot of the competition in this price range. Now, the only downside is that you have to build it yourself. You have to have some diligence to build it yourself. And that's to keep the cost low. Now, mind you, you can build this speaker, probably took me a few hours, uh, you know, it may take you a day, but that's about it. It's not gonna take you months or weeks as if you're designing a DIY speaker for yourself, um, you know, which can take a very long time to do so. It doesn't take that kind of effort, but you still keep the cost down low because you are technically the builder, the person doing the labor. So that brings me to positioning of the speaker. Now, this speaker, when you tilt them towards your ears uh, directly, dead on, then it can get a little bit tad bright. Now, if you tilt them slightly away from your, uh, yourself, your ears, or towards out the room, then that's when it really shines. And I, in my opinion, I had them you know, just straight out facing out to the room, and that's how I liked it because it gave me a, it threw me a larger sound stage, a larger sweet spot, it still had perfect imaging, and it wasn't sharp at all with most of the tracks that I listened to, and it was very pleasant to listen to. Now also, they are ported in the back, so having a little bit room out into the room does help, but I didn't find it, need, it needs that much room uh, from the side walls or the back walls as much. But of course, with any speaker design, you know, if you have it a little bit out into the room, then it does benefit significantly when it comes to your listening experience. So I suggest that you can get you know, if you can give them space, give them some space, breathing room, and they will definitely repay you with the experience. And is it good at low and high listening volumes? And I have to say, low volumes, it sounds incredible. Higher volumes, it sounds even better. And that's the beauty of the speaker. Even at low volumes, I thought it was just perfect. I could tell the separation is happening in the imaging. Uh, the tonal characteristic is all there. Nothing degrades, in my opinion. Uh, with higher volume, obviously you get more volume, more emphasis, more uh, gut to the sound and stuff like that. So higher volumes is always better. Maybe that's because I'm a punk, but yeah. So that's pretty much it. You know, it excels at low volumes as well. And I know some of you guys are gonna be like, well, you know, I need good stands. Well, here's the thing. I'll link in the description below some inexpensive stands that I use. They are less than $100 in some cases in some countries, and they are fabulous. You know, no plastic, they're you know, full metal. You fill it, fill it with sand, and you have a perfectly good high-end stand that you can use with this speaker and any other speaker. So I'll link it in the description of this video for you to check out as well. So check it out. Now, getting into the um, components I used with this speaker. Obviously, I used Hegel which was a fabulous match, by the way. I used First Watt, which was my favorite um, recommendation for this, um, for this speaker. It's the First Watt brought out the bass region, the deeper extension, so I really love that. Um, now, this speaker is 87 dB at eight ohms, and it seems to like a bit of power. Now, with the First Watt F7 being 25 watts per channel in class A, you do need a preamplifier. For example, I was using the ModRite LS100, to crank up the volume to a certain level, you need some gain um, in the preamp section. So here, you know, it's not that demanding in terms of components. Um, practically, I paired it up with a lot of different components, like even the Sound Artist um, integrated amplifier, which was around you know 300 something dollars. You know, landed here in Canada, probably around 600 Canadian dollars. But even then, 
that uh, you know integrated amplifier sounded really good with these speakers. You now the high end, um, the high frequency was a little bit more tad bright, but that's a presentation that you can cater towards. And I had a brief chance to pair it up with the Wasenton R8, which was reviewed on this channel. It's no longer here, but I had a brief chance before it was finished in one of veneer to hook it up and have a listen to it. And I was pretty blown away with tubes. The sound stage becomes even larger and very, very crisp, clear, uh, great dynamics, holographic, and just really, really, really great sound. So even with tubes, this speaker excels in every way possible. Now you do have to keep in mind, like I said, the only downside is that you have to build it yourself. You do have to pay for veneering if you want to get a nice finish. Uh, the sky is a limit in terms of budget. So on a final note, um, we were, we have been contemplating a lot on this channel whether I can give an award to the speaker because it's a DIY speaker, you know, Jay built it. How can we give an award to a speaker that's a DIY kit? That can be varied depending on, you know, if you buy the knockdown cabinet or not and stuff like that, upgrade a crossover. And we've come down to say, well, it performs so well for the value. It is incredible um, in every aspect. It is high end for less. Now, just to give you a retrospect, if you, um, let's say, you know, Swans Fiber came to you and said, well, we're going to give you a $14,000 speaker and we're going to let you build it for, you know, let's say $3,000. Would you not do it? I would do it. I would I would say, hell yes, please, you know, give me the kit. I'll build it myself. Now, that's kind of the case here. So, you know, I think it's a tremendous value and opportunity with this DIY kit. So I do have to give an award. The only way I would be able to do it is to uh only when you guys can replicate it exactly. So the award I'm gonna give to is is with the superior crossover, with the knockdown cabinet that they provide and with their drivers, obviously. And so this kit right here, whatever I have right here without the one of veneer is what I'm going to give the award to. Now, the last thing that I do want to mention is that you can play around with the port and I don't think that, um, you know, affects it as much, but the port in the back, I have it at nine inches. Uh, so the port is nine inches long and you can slide it back and forth to adjust it. Initially, I had it at six inches. So here's the thing, if you have a uh, um, shorter tube length, then the bass is a little bit more emphasized, the high frequency is a little bit trimmed down uh, in comparison to having the tubes uh, a little bit longer. So I did like it finally with the nine inch setup, which is the recommendation from CSS Audio, but you get to play around with that tube um, adjustment. And that's the beauty about DIY kits. You know, if you buy the speaker and you want to adjust it in some way, you can because it is at the end of the day, your baby something that you can build and tweak and stuff like that. So the award I'm gonna give to you is with the nine inch tube um, length, but also with a six inch, you know, I have no problem saying that this still qualifies as the um, award winning speaker. So there you have it. That's pretty much it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, if I missed anything, just leave a comment down in the below and I will get back to you as soon as possible. So thank you very much guys for watching this video. Make sure to subscribe and like this video. Like I said, if you do like this video, it does help us out a tremendous amount and I appreciate it very much. So thank you and I'll see you guys in the next one.